Hi everyone. I'm Simon. How are we all doing? Are you keenly aware that I'm the thing that's standing between you and beer? How very keenly aware. Um, this ridiculous piece of Microsoft crap um, is refusing to do what it did do before, <sighs> which is just fabulous, isn't it? Apologies while I get this actually, you know, on a screen. Hey, so I can do this a little bit while I'm doing that. I'm Simon Sharwood um, and I work for The Register. Everyone out there familiar with what The Register is and what we do? Yep, you are? Hey, good. Um, who reads it? Give us a hand. Hey, who knows that every time you read a Register story, my children get a bowl of rice? <coughs> That's the way journalism works these days, um, which is pretty neat. No, that's still balked. <sighs> you see, we did this wee rehearsal thing. Who knows that if you click on an ad on the register, my children get a shoe. But the problem is we end up with a lot of left shoes. So what I've got to do is ask you to click on two ads every time you visit the register. Who runs ad blocker and never sees our ads anyway? Actually, that's fewer than, than it used to be. Um, it's part of our business model. We understand this. Uh, yes, <laughs> uh, but that's a different story. Hang on, we'll just, we'll just sort this out. Won't, won't take a minute. Um, I can do some of this without the slides because the slides, frankly, aren't that interesting. Um, and what I wanted to say first up in this talk is I'm Simon, I'm from the Register, and boy, am I in trouble. <laughs> um, I'm in real deep here today. Oh, there we go. Um, the reason I'm in deep is back in about, what was it guys, September, October, when I volunteered to do this talk, I gave it the title, Funny Stories from the Register. And then when I sat down to write this talk last week, I said to myself, am I a comedian? No. Am I a journalist? Yes. And is journalism funny? Hell no. So I thought to myself, I thought to myself, what's the last time I had a really, really good chuckle in a theatre? And I thought back to seeing uh, the creator of The Simpsons, Matt Groening, speak at the Opera House uh, in, at the Graphic Festival in September 2016. Anybody else go to that? Ah, oh, you all missed out. There was so much love in the room and he was just gorgeous and he told all these stories um, about, you know, basically how The Simpsons are his family, his parents and his siblings. And then he drew, he had, you know, just some note paper up here and he pulled out a, a, um, a magic marker and just with a few little strokes, all of a sudden the Simpsons came to life in front of you on stage. And it was just beautiful, you know, the, the, the audience melted. And then he just kind of ran out of stuff to say. So he did this slideshow and he sli showed about a hundred pictures of the worst Simpsons tattoos <coughs> that he's ever seen. Um, there's one that I didn't put in here because it's Bart mooning somebody and it's exactly where you'd expect a tattoo of mooning somewhere to, someone to be. Um, there are things like this, Rod and Todd. <laughs> Why would you get those on you? Um, my personal favourite is um, Millhouse as, <coughs> as my little pony. And so I thought to myself, you know, maybe what I should do is, in an attempt to tell funny Foss war stories from the Reg, is, you know, not just actually tell the stories, but give you a few snapshots of them in the same way that Matt Groening gave you a few snapshots. Now, these snapshots come from a thing that um, I'm very proud to say that I kind of invented called On Call. Every Friday at 0700 GMT, we basically put up um, a cranky, beardy, sysadmin story. Um, and the readers send them in at the rate of about eight or 10 a week. It's just, it's vastly humbling that people write to this and hope that we're gonna put them up on the reg. Um, and they're nearly always stories of, you know, stupid users, ridiculous bosses, a whole bunch of things and they go off, they do fabulous engagement, they average about 130 comments a week and I know 100 is only a number but it's a nice number to get and you know, thousands and thousands of upvotes and downvotes every week. If I get hit by a bus on the way home, the first thing that my bosses in London are going to say is who's going to do on call from now on. So I thought I'd share a few of those stories and just sketch out what goes uh, behind the headlines. So this is one from late last year that I'm pretty fond of. This one comes from the, the, the days when people were just starting to cross over from, uh, from DOS and from CLI-based machines into Windows, and this poor user just wasn't quite um, across exactly what this would mean and asked for her PC to be moved into a sunny place. 
Um, this is a cracking one from a bloke who um, worked in a startup. And I think the headline pretty much says it all there. He didn't last too long in that job. Um, I forget what the reference is to um, freezing off their toes. I think there was something in a fridge. Anyway, I probably shouldn't just ramble stuff I don't know at you. This is a beautiful one. So this is a sysadmin who gets a call from somebody out uh, on, on, on the floor and they say, look, I need you to guess my password. And the sysadmin gets down there and he says, you know, look, you've probably watched a whole bunch of CSI and you probably think that all I have to do is sit down and start guessing passwords and that simply won't work. Look, I'm going to type in password one. To go a bit Simpsons again. Go! Oh. Um, any guesses from when this story was set? Give me a decade. Anyone? So 2000s? No, no, we've got to go back a bit in time. No, 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 before then. No, no. This, this is a story about the 1970s when the data centre was more of just, you know, a server room and there was a mainframe in it and there was nylon carpet and there were a whole bunch of people walking past it all day wearing polyester. And eventually they figured out that all the bloody static shocks that were coming at this thing every day would occasionally give a reasonably fragile 70s era uh, mainframe um, enough for a bit of a hiccup. So what did they do? Gave everybody 100 bucks and said go buy some cotton clothes. And to me, that's, uh, that's one of the best debugging uh, stories uh, that, uh, that, that you'll ever hear. I mean, by all means, try that one. Uh, try that one. Next time you've got a problem, probably won't work. I love this one. We get a lot of stories um, about dumb bosses or, you know, just pissant bosses who insist on techies doing ridiculous things. And this bloke apparently you know, would wander around saying, I read it in my for dummies book. I read it in my for dummies book. But it was for dummies for an OS that the organisation didn't run. Um, anybody got a boss like that? No? Lucky. Uh, I do like this one. This was a, a, a couple in which the wife ran a small business and her retired husband was doing the, uh, the, the IT for it. Um, and she essentially said, what am I paying you for? At which, at, at which point he went to play golf. <laughs> and by the third call on the golf course, he said, now how much are you paying me again? And uh, that sorted itself all out rather nicely. This one is an epic story, just an epic story. For a while we had a run of readers sending in stories about being sent ridiculous distances to do jobs, so you know, five hour drive so that somebody could figure out where the on switch was, a whole bunch of stuff like that. And then this guy came in and trumped it all. He had to take a um, train and then a couple of flights and the last flight was in a light plane and he already had a bit of a dodgy back and this light plane hit an air pocket or whatever, it went bump hard and he ruptured a vertebrae or something. But you know, this was, a, this was a level one alert and he'd been flown all the way out into the wilderness to get this job done. Um, so he, he suffered through two days of getting this job done whilst being basically unable to walk. And then the boss showed up to do a site inspection to make sure that everything was A-OK -okay again. And he had to stump around after the boss on the official tour doing this. And then he got home and literally had to lie down um, you know, on boards for a month to survive this one act of sysadminery. Um, anybody out there can top that? Then come and talk to me. Um, after this talk. Um, we had all sorts of weird things. We had guys who were basically flown out to oil rigs to work and then there was nothing for them to do there but there was no helicopter coming home for a week. Um, <laughs> they got paid. Um, then off the back of that we had a run of people sending in stories of being paid to do nothing. And this was basically either, you know, there'd been mass sackings and somebody forgot to put you on the list so you just sit around for a couple of years or just the machinery grinds really, really slowly sometimes. And so there was this bloke, he got a job and they said, this is the project. And then he sat on his hands for two years waiting for the project brief, getting paid, sitting around, playing Tetris, who knows what else. Um, this stuff happens. And, you know, sometimes that makes a cranky sysadmin a very, very bored sysadmin. We've got a lot of stories about this. So I did promise um, open source stories, didn't I? Um, this is one of my favourites. I don't know if this was true or not 
And we always say in the on-call stories that, you know, this is what readers tell us. But, you know, who, who has or who, who hasn't, I suppose, um, had a tech support scam? Hello, this is from Microsoft and Telstra says you have a virus. Anybody not had that call? Really? You're waiting. They're tremendous calls. My 16-year-old, when he gets those, he is so very rude to those poor people in wherever they are doing this horrible job of ringing up and trying to scam people. And in no way is he modelling the same behaviour that he heard his father doing one day. <laughs> and in no way am I ashamed of myself. And I never have it pointed out to me that I've modelled bad behaviour by my wife. An hour and a half, yeah. Well, this guy c c claimed that he convinced the scammer um, once he let him remote in that, yes, this really was Windows and that all the familiar things that his script said you'd do to Windows in order to hijack it could be done if you'd only just stay on the line long enough to do it. And, yeah, kept him going for a long time. Um, what I've discovered with those people after modelling bad behaviour is that if you're rude to them, they will call you back about ten times and abuse you um, very roundly. I then discovered that referring to certain cricketers who may also be deities uh, just makes things worse. Um, so, do not make crude comments about Sachin Tendulkar if you've learned anything today. And this is kind of my personal favourite and I thought it would be a really good note to end on. So, this was a story about a help desk who gets a call from an academic who says, um, Outlook lost all my email. And this was a bloke who had been forced to migrate uh, from Linux to Windows uh, and from Thunderbird to Outlook and who found Outlook just completely confounding and confusing and rubbish uh, and blamed the poor old sysadmin for lo losing all of his email. Um, and I reckon that's probably as, as good a place as any to let you all go and drink beer. Um, I, I nearly always, when I do these talks, uh, bring along some red swag and give it away to the best comment or the funniest comment or the funniest question, and I completely forgot to do that today. Um, my life's a bit up and down at the moment, moving house, renovating house, general weirdness, but if any of you do have another story to toss into the pile or a comment, I promise I will find a way to bring you in. Um, you can choose. I've got uh, register cycling jerseys. I think in medium and small, vulture velo, they say. Um, or I've got um, a bar fridge in my office that's full of mugs and I really want to get rid of the bar fridge so I'd love to be able to give away the mugs. So give it a shot, guys. There's one. General manager, so I had to go and support a general manager and help him connect up via an old Nokia, uh, his AS400 system, so he could change and check some prices. I happened to have to do this in hospital. He had just came out of surgery. He was wearing an actual suit, like gown. The doctors came in and started talking to me and basically telling me what was wrong and what was going on in the surgery. They thought you were next of kin. They thought I was his wife and he was sat there the whole time just absolutely smiling and I had to listen to this 30 minute sprawl and at the end of it say, sorry, I'm just here to fix his machine. <laughs> Was, 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 was he repulsively pudgy and hairy-backed as well? No, 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 he wasn't, oh, no. Phew. Yeah. Because <laughs> there's nothing worse than seeing your boss naked. <laughs> it, um, yeah, it was, it was a, definitely an interesting experience, okay. put it that way. Cool. <laughs> I think we've got one up the back in the blue T-shirt. Sorry, I've, I've sprung with one here. I've sprung this on the organisers totally, so sorry, guys. Hello. Uh, this is not a Linux story, and it's some time back, but uh, my deck engineer in Lismore he was in hospital at the time, uh, and he took a hardware call for the VMS machines in the basement of the hospital. So he's taken a call, wandered, wandered down to the data centre in his um, white shirt with his bum hanging out and <laughs> fixes the hardware. <laughs> we, got, we got another couple. So this one's a teachable moment when I was doing work experience at a university that was doing Antarctic research, and they had a cray. Um, the I was ones? got a sorry the C-shaped one. Yes, yes. Oh, nice. Okay. Uh, very uncomfortable, actually. But anyway, so we got a call from one of the professors, and he's he had a key question: Is there another editor other than Vi on the Cray? 
And my mentor, who I still look up to this day, told me, yes, there is. Tell him to use Ed. We won't hear from him again. And we did not. <laughs> yeah. So this is about um, 1993, and I was a sysadmin for a system remotely in Antarctica, working Ooh. from Australia. And a very low board rate link down there. So it was a 0.9 Linux kernel running off a single floppy. And we, sending somebody out into the shed in the middle of the snow was a little difficult. So the, the sysadmin problem I hit was the parity bit on the serial multiplexer broke so I could only type characters with, I think it was even parity. Um, and it meant that I had to repair this system, trying to work out what commands at the Linux prompt you could use remotely to diagnose and, and fix this system. And did manage to get it up with the help of Emacs and the tab key. Ah, oh, congratulations. So, Years ago, before I joined the Reg, I, I spoke to some guys at UNSW who run the IT at a place called Dome C. Anybody know where Dome C is? Dome C is 3,000 metres up, right in the middle of the Antarctic Plateau. It's the coldest, windiest, whitest, nastiest place on Earth. And we've put some uh, astronomical observatories there because the air is so clear. Um, it's kind of a major expedition with, you know, a whole bunch of snowmobiles just to go out there and people go out there about every three years to just check on the instruments um, and to put new stuff in there. And, yeah, I spoke to the guys who built and ran the stuff out there and they had it easy compared to you, I'm glad to say. But, yeah, that, that was a, a, an act of extreme sysadminery, if I'm allowed to keep using that ridiculous noun. I think we had one over the back there. Yeah, I've got the mic here. Oh, got the mic there. Okay, sorry. So, related to this, of course, power is important when you're a system administrator. And we had the state run electricity company need to do some work on our three phase coming into a very large building on a university campus. Mm -hmm. So we put our backup system and a number of servers there onto the gen set. Now, when you go back from a generator to mains power, you need to make sure your generator is synchronized in phase with the mains, else bad things happen. We were assured by the state government power supply system <coughs> that they had done this. It turns out they had not. And when you suddenly reconnect mains to this, there's a big fight between the generators that you own and the generators that the state owns. And the ones that the state owns win. So what <laughs> ends up happening is that the motor stops in place and the generator rotates around it, explodes <laughs> and bursts into fire. So we then had to call out the fire service to come and put out the fire that they had caused and we lost power to the entire building once again, which caused us to go through the entire process of getting them to replace all of the three phase. That's a ripper. So just, just yesterday, I started up a companion piece to these stories. So the, the, the you know, bad user, bad boss stories are called uh, On Call. And the new ones we're doing is basically tech, tech fuck up confessions. We're, we're calling that who me. And I got an email overnight from a bloke who said, I might be the reason we don't know if there's life on Mars. Um, <laughs> because he, he unplugged something that was bringing in telemetry from uh, the Mars Viking missions um, and they missed a few minutes of data. So, uh, yeah, ain't it, ain't it great? Mm. Okay, so last yeah. one here. Last now. one, sorry, I'm keeping you all from beer. So, um, this one's probably not quite as spectacular as the last one, but uh, quite a few years ago I was working for a company uh, that looked after a lot of gas distribution and control systems and we were migrating from one company to another and we were outfitting the new data center they were installing a vesda system i'm pretty sure everyone here knows what that is um anyway we're working away you know we're, we're working through lots of support issues from the migration across platforms and all of a sudden oh servers stopped responding all the servers have stopped responding the entire gas control network has stopped responding. Oh, that's good. And then we saw the VESDA installation techs quickly run out of the server room, jump in the lift and go downstairs. <laughs> Turns out what had happened, the apprentice, in an effort to uh, leave the uh, data centre, didn't realise that the door handle on the inside of the door was locked. Uh, was unlocked, sorry. So you just walk up and 
turn the handle and walk out. So he thought that it would be a good idea to lift the plastic cover with the locked latch and press the illuminated red switch underneath that said, do not press, <laughs> to try and get out of the data centre. Yeah, and this is, um, this is why we all love working in IT. <laughs> Even in journalism. So, uh, look, there have been some laughs, so hopefully I, I, I did meet the brief that I set myself. Please remember, two ads means pair of shoes for my kids. Uh, thanks for listening, and to those of you who read, uh, a really sincere thanks. Um, uh, publishing remains a, a, a very challenged business, but we're trying real hard to bring you real great news and also put a smile on your face. So thanks and enjoy Bureaucracy.